Hello, welcome to the next in our series of Asian Health Talks. My name is Bryant Lin. I am a co-director and co-founder of the Center for Asian Health Research and Education, and I'm very pleased to bring you this series of talks uh, co-sponsored by the Stanford Health Library. And the talks overall are sponsored by the Vincent B.C. Wu Foundation. Great thanks to the foundation for supporting this series. Today, we have a talk on health illness and social support in the Asian American community, uh, doc brought to you by Dr. Grace Yu. Grace Yu, PhD, MPH, is professor and former chair of Asian American studies at San Francisco State University. She's a medical sociologist with a background in public health who has spent 30 years teaching and researching about health, illness, and social support among Asian Americans. She is the co-author with Barbara Kim of Caring Across Generations, the Linked Lives of Korean American Families, which received the 2015 Asia and Asia Asian American Section Best Book Award from the American Sociological Society. She is also editor, co-editor of three books, including the Encyclopedia of Asian Americans Today with Edith Chen, the Handbook of Asian American Health with uh, Mai Nung Lee and Alan Oda, and Koreans in America, History, Identity, and Community. She has also published widely in journals such as Health Education and Behavior, Supportive Center, Supportive Cancer Center, um, so Supportive Cancer Care, excuse me, Ethnicity and Disease, and Journal of Immigrant and Minority Health. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Yu. Thanks for joining us today, Dr. Yu. Thank you, Dr. Lin, and thank you, Stanford, um, for hosting this presentation. Um, in my presentations, I always like to see who's in the audience. Um, so in the in the chat feature, can you list your name and the city that you're 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 um, zooming from, and what brings you to this presentation? So the prompt is, I am in this presentation because. And so I would just love to see who's in our audience. Uh, again, I'm a medical sociologist, I've, and I love connections with other people. And so I'd love to see who's in our audience. So if you wouldn't mind putting your name in the chat and what city you're zooming from and what brings you to this presentation, that would be great. Um, great. So the chat feature should be on the, you know, below on your Zoom, and just sort of click on there, and let's see who will, um, who's in, who's in our Zoom. Geronimo San Jose, wondering how I can improve spiritual care for Asian American patients and families. That's amazing. May in Los Altos, Edith Chen. I'm zooming from Culver City. I'm here to hear in this presentation to learn more about API health issues. Alex Long from Houston, Texas. Welcome. This is great. We've got folks from um, outside of the area that are also zooming in. This is fantastic. Um, Jiyoung uh, Kim from Palo Alto. I'm interested in Asian health. Charlotte from Berkeley, interested in learning about resources. Jean Yi from Stanford Interpreter Service. Bill Ng from Sacramento, longtime interest in Asian American health, health issues. And Nicole, I'm in Sunnyvale. Both my partner and I are Asian Americans with aging parents dealing with terminal and non-terminal issues, health issues. Uh, Arnav, I'm in this presentation because I'm a department chair and assistant professor of public health at Cal State East Bay, and my research is on Asian American health disparities. And Cynthia, I'm in Millbrae and currently work at Stanford Healthcare, interested in Asian health, about Asian health and how to offer family support. Well, welcome everyone. It's so awesome to see everybody's name through this chat. Karen Ng from Honolulu, who's an educator and support, social support um, group facilitator. Um, Karen So from Houston. Wow, we've got folks from out of the area. And Tracy Al from Stanford Healthcare. Um, qual nursing quality, APA, ERG. Well, welcome everybody and feel free to continually put stuff in the chat. It's great to, to see uh, you all on Zoom this evening. Um, so again, my presentation is on health, um, health, illness and social support in the Asian American community. Um, as Dr. Lin has mentioned, I'm a medical sociologist and also a professor in Asian American studies. And I've been studying for about 30 years, various health issues and aging issues in the Asian American community and really around really looking at the concept of social support. Now, I just wanted to talk about, this is, this is me this last week. And um, my, um, this is my elderly mom and she was exposed to COVID. Um, and we knew it was a matter of days um, that she would come down with COVID and there was no one home. Um, and my niece and sister were away. Were away and everyone was a bit frantic. Who can we call if something happens 
to my mom. And what we found out during COVID is that it's really hard uh, to find folks that might be willing to support my mom because of the fear of catching COVID. And so um, I flew down to Southern California last week to be with my mother. My mother. Uh, my mother eventually did come down with COVID and I've been with my mom for the last eight days. I've been masking um, and keeping windows open and um, knock on wood, I've not tested, I, I knock on wood, I've not gotten COVID. <laughs> But um, uh, of course, there, while in quarantine with my mother though, there have been things breaking down, like the toilet. Um, in fact, I got a, an alert from my wa the water company that we had, uh, there was 12, a 1200 gallon leak occurring in the house. And so um, we turned off the water and we manually put water in the toilet bowl, bowl several times a day for five days. And by the way, a plumber would not come to our house because of COVID, because there's someone with COVID. And so we didn't have a plumber. We, I envisioned that we would not have a plumber, plumber for the next 10 days. Um, and so I was determined to fix the toilet. I watched four hours of YouTube and, and YouTube and received lots of encouragement from my family and friends via text. And I fixed it. I can fix a toilet. So I, I um, and I can be of support to people. And I am grateful for the informational support of YouTube. But um, I wanted to share this because I wanted to say that even during this time period, during COVID, um, there, there are many kinds of support, supports that we need. Uh, and for me, during this week, my mother's been improving. It's really been a plumber, <laughs> a plumber. And thank goodness for YouTube and the informational support I received. I, I watched about four, four hours and I was able to fix my mother's toilet. Um, so anyways, again, welcome to this presentation. There are several learning outcomes that we'll be doing today. Um, we're gonna explore the context and research on Asian Americans health, illness and social support. We're gonna review some past studies that I've been a part of on Asian American health and illness and social support. And then we're gonna identify and discuss supportive uh, and caring Asian American communities. Um, and also, I also welcome, by the way, anyone throughout my presentation, you qu any questions you might have, I'd love to engage with the audience. And so I'll be presenting, but I'm hoping that we'll have enough time for some Q&A. So these are the learning outcomes tonight that we'll be exploring. So um, this, is, this is social support illness, by the way. People, we, we know that people with larger social networks and quality support have been shown to recover from illness faster and are be better able to cope with illness than people who do not have social support. And this is widely known. So many different studies that have affirmed this, this finding. Um, and so I, I've always been interested in looking at social support and, um, you know, um, and, and especially in the context of the life course, um, you know, these are, by the way, these are top, top 10 stressful life events that um, some of us and many of us may experience in our lifetime. Um, birth, illness in family and to, in, illness and injury, injury um, to, in, in, among our family, marriage and divorce, job loss, illness and injury, retirement, death of a spouse, spouse death of a close family member, and a family member experiencing jail or prison time. These are top stressful life events. Um, what we know as we encounter stress, what is an amazing coping resource is social support. And social support, by the way, there are many domains of social support and it's been defined as emotional, instrumental, informational, and appraisal. And for many years, scientists have recognized this positive relationship between social support and health across all age groups. And there are three main types a supportive interactions that's emotional and emotional would be sort of talking to someone when you're stressed out and that sort of uh, that that in that interaction and informational support would be information that you might receive i would say you know with getting my toilet fixed for my mother that and youtube became informational support for me and then instrumental support instrumental support may be uh, a meal prepared for you um, or a ride to the doctor's office that's instrumental support and so, um, so in addition to social support, uh, there are social networks and social networks represents these interpersonal ties that provide support. Again, they can be the, the ties um, that can provide various types of support, whether it's emotional, informational, ta tangible, companionship or financial. It can involve family and friendship ties and neighbors and service providers and community organizations. Um, and, it can be uh, examined by its configuration, but also the actual perceived and availability of social support. And so 
there's a lot of research on social networks. There's a whole area called social network analysis. Um, so um, I wanted to really talk about Asian American health, health and illness and social support and just really sharing my research for the last, from the last 25 years that I've, I've done and published. Um, and um, I also wanted to share the various social cultural challenges, shifts and opportunities. And I have to say that for Asian Americans, the, the greatest thing that we encounter uh, in, various encounter in various interactions is the stereotype, is our stereotypes. The stereotypes of Asian Americans often being stereotyped, stereotyped as the healthy mi model minority, meaning that we don't have any health problems, or the forever foreigner that we could never be from the United States. Or how about as of recent during the pandemic, seen as the China virus? Um, and then just the, the stereotype that we're this monolithic group. And then finally, that we're never considered a population that needs support. And that's huge. These are these are all these stereotypes can impact the support that we receive um, from others. So this is a really important understanding in terms of stereotypes, because um, it affects all kinds of healthcare enc encounters. In fact, I'm just gonna give you a very short story about my father at Kaiser. When he would go to Kaiser, he would always tell everyone at Kaiser, at every healthcare encounter, my daughter is a public health professor at San Francisco State University. And at every encounter, he would say that. And, and I thought, I, you know, I, some people, might have thought it was bragging, um, but I know my father was doing that so that the health the health healthcare providers could human could, could humanize him, could really just see him. Um, and um, but he would do that all the time. And in fact, when I would enter a Kaiser with my dad, um, they would say, "Are you that daughter? Are you that daughter?" And again, it was again my way of way of my father showing, um, you know, that he could he should be respected. Um, and again, this is in the face of so many stereotypes that Asian Americans may face. Um, I want to make mention that the older Asian American population is growing. We can see this production for 2019 to 2060. It is a, a, a population that's growing, and it's a population that is also primarily foreign-born or immigrants. Um, and so it's a it's it's a population um, also that experiences various health issues, um, comorbidities, uh, chronic illnesses. Um, and by the way, I wanted to just share briefly some statistics on Asian Americans and health, because I think these various statistics uh, impact social support and the need for social support. Um, Asian Americans have higher odds of having diabetes compared to non-Hispanic whites. Um, and Filipino Americans have nearly three times the odds of having diabetes compared to non-Hispanic whites. And Korean Americans and Vietnamese Americans have higher rates of lacking a usual source of care than non-Hispanic whites. Um, also, um, studies have shown that Korean Americans delay seeking care more often than um, um, both non-Hispanic whites and Asians overall. Um, and that Korean Americans and Filipino Americans delay medications more often than um, Asians overall. And again, this is, these are just some statistics uh, I wanted to share because th th all of that impacts social support. Um, now, when I first started looking at social support, I really, really, you know, about 20 years ago, I was really looking at older Asian Americans, and I was really studying older Chinese and Korean Americans, and their the meaning of family support for for this population. And we had done focus groups in San Francisco uh, with about 52 elders, and we asked them, "What what does social support mean to you? What does family support mean to you?" And what we found in our study is that immigration was bringing changes. Uh, to people's concepts around support. Um, many of folks were living separately from their adult children, um, and there was a need to extend their social network beyond their family. And that also too, in this immigration process, that family change changes were also occurring, that parents were no longer authority figures in families, um, and elderly immigrants were more independent. And so there was this changed perspective of what family social support should be and that they were becoming much more bicultural. Again, this was a study that we'd done um, almost two decades ago, really looking at social support. Um, and we had followed up, you know, in other studies that we, and publications that we'd uh, done with this population, we were examining the types of social support and the actual sources of support, social, social support in older Chinese and Korean immigrants in the San Francisco area. And we realized that language support was a key support that was a need for this population. And that also that older Chinese and Korean immigrants really had a small number of actual sources of support. So their social network for support was actually quite small. And their main source of support 
were, were really their adult children, the adult children who were helping them with personal situations. However, their friends were, gen they were there for general information, advice and companionship. Um, and that these elders also used formal services and the ethnic immigrant church uh, for support when needed or offered. Um, now I, I wanna transition, I, you know, I've studied again um, elders, but I've also studied adult children of immigrants. And this is a book that I had co-written with um, Dr. Barbara Kim at Cal State Long Beach, who's also another, another sociologist. It's called Caring Across Generations and Linked Lives of Korean American Fam Families. And it studied the dynamics of adult children and their aging parents. And um, just to let you know, the children of immigrants, um, children with at least one fourth pair, uh, one, one foreign born parent now comprise almost one fourth of US children under the age of 18. And immigrant parents are kind of a unique population in that in addition to hardships around finances and English proficiency, immigrant parents just have a lot going on their plate. There's been studies that show that they've significantly significantly higher, higher levels of um, parental aggra aggravation and lack knowledge about supportive resources on parenting and non-immigrant parents. Also, we know in the United States, immigrants constantly struggle with belonging, psychological stress, distress and discrimination. So there's a lot happening for children of immigrants growing up um, in a home with immigrant parents. And so this was what the book was about. And um, we were we were also taking a look at basically how does being a child of an immigrant shape your life course from childhood to middle, middle adulthood? And in particular for this presentation, how do children of immigrants care over the, over the life course? Um, and we really looked at how Caring for many uh, children of immigrants is being was being started started in childhood childhood as language and cultural broker, brokers, and the caring continued as aging parents faced declining health. Um, and again, our study was grounded in everyday real uh, every great everyday uh, realities. Older Asian Americans again are primarily an immigrant population, uh, and studies have shown that compared to whites. Asian Americans are more likely to state that their doctor did not listen to them, understand their background, and did not adequately ed educate and inform them about major medical decisions. And they also report less referrals to cancer screenings, counseling, and diabetic services. Um, and many Asian American respondents are more likely to attribute these poor, poor doctor-patient relationships to their race and limited English ability and believe that they would be treated with more respect by their doctor if they were white. Um, and again, um, in, important statistics uh, and research to understand as uh, we think about um, the, the role of adult children. And so, um, as we I mentioned, we had followed the, the stories of Korean American fam Korean Americans, um, 137 Korean Americans who had at least one parent over the age of 55 who resided in the San Francisco Bay Area or the Los Angeles area, um, and who were who who was who were either 1.5 or second generation, and we had done qualitative in-depth interviews um, with the, this um, population. And you know, a key theme in what we collected was that children were language brokers. And from a very young age, uh, children of immigrants became familiar with the English language and American culture, culture faster. And from a young age, they had taken on roles from translating, writing legal letters, filling out business forms, accompanying parents to doctor offices, uh, to interpret medical information and interact with various officials, as well as helping parents at a young age in, in their business or at home. And, um, and so what we found is that, you know, this is sort of over the life course that the children of immigrants really had a unique role as, as language and cultural bro brokers. And so when their parents faced declining health, they continued this role. Um, and uh, the work of adult children was uh, immigrants' parents' vulnerability um, being ignored or neglected by healthcare providers stimulated many kinds of advocacy by adult children. And uh, respondents helped immigrant pa parents from gaining access to healthcare through Medicare or helping their parents cope with, uh, with and manage their illnesses or searching for, or to search for information on the internet communicating a diagnosis and their necessary treatments between doctors and immigrant parents or translating necessary information. Um, so the work of adult uh, children, again, this is an example of gaining access to health. This is Michelle. At the time she was 30 years old, she said, 
he had cancer, but because he didn't have health insurance, we didn't know. I graduated from college and I came back to LA in December. December, nobody, nobody told me he was sick, nobody. I didn't think he, he even knew he was sick. He thought he had indigestion. He had liver cancer, but nobody knew. And when he came, when I came down, he was getting worse and worse, but he didn't have insurance. So I took him to the LA County Hospital. By the time they admitted him, 80% of his liver was cancerous. So there was no way that he could live. So he told us, your dad has three to six months, go home and wait for him to die. And again, this is Michelle, again, um, becoming, becoming an advocate for her father um, and trying to gain access to health. Um, this is another example of uh, cultural and langu language brokering uh, encounter. This is Lo Lois, who was 45 years old at the time. She said, I remember just standing there. My mom's lying on the exam, ta exam, exam table saying, what did she just say? And I just lost all words. I couldn't even re remember. My mind went totally blank. I'm sure it took me like five minutes to come up with words. I remember saying, mom, you've got to hold on. I have to think of the words. And then of course I found the word cancer. And so this is Lois describing how um, her mom getting diagnosed with cancer, having to translate, process that information and then translate that information and convey that to her mother. Um, this is also Paul, who was 48 years old at the time, talking about um, being a child of, of an immigrant means working to get quality health care for their parent. He, and he talks about, I actually used my documentary experience to advocate for my mom with a health care system. It took her like almost five months to see a neurologist. I got fed up with this, so I brought my video camera, camera. And that particular morning, she was scheduled to see a neurologist. But again, she was routed to another floor. I had my camera on my shoulder and I said, I just want to document my mom's health care to make sure she sees somebody because her health is degenerating. So they did two things. They called the sheriff and two, they found two neurologists on that same day and they spent 40 minutes with her and she got the best care, but they also called the sheriff. So it was a little sacrifice for me. And so again, Paul talks about being an advocate for his mother um, but also kind of the troubles he encounters by being such a strong advocate. So, you know, in, in the book that we had published, we had published multiple other things about what it meant to be a child of an immigrant, but our chapter on health was really, it really demonstrated that the adult children of immigrants were our key support network and that the children of immigrants do both invisible and visible work, especially as parents face aging and health concerns. And this is rooted in systemic um, inequities that really exist in the healthcare system for immigrants and the need to help parents advocate and navigate these systems. Um, so, you know, um, that, so that was a study that we'd done with 137 Korean American, the children of Korean Americans. And so um, I've been doing other studies because I've been wanting to understand what's it like um, helping a, an aging parent with type two diabetes. And so we have done a study, uh, I've done a study with UCSF School of Nursing and some colleagues on looking at Filipino Americans and Chinese Americans, uh, aging parents and adult children, and that sort of relationship around um, looking at family support around type two diabetes. And so this is just some of our preliminary findings that we've been looking at in terms of older Asian Americans with type two diabetes and their adult child. Really, there's really few studies, by the way, um, looking at, Asian American families and health, um, there are really few studies, like, like you can only count them on your hand. Um, but, um, and, and there, like no studies on Asian Americans and type two diabetes and families, even though the numbers that, it, you know, are, type two diabetes is increasing in our community and diabetes prevalence, of course, increases with age. Um, but in our study, we found that there were nonlinear stages that families would encounter, adult child and their aging parent. Um, and, and one was independence, you know, that there's an, this need for independence in terms of adult children not trying to manage their aging parents' type 2 diabetes. Um, and then kind of this, a, a change, you know, being a transitional phase where there, there is tension around management, around type 2 diabetes, um, and then eventual partnership and eventual stepping in. And so, um, 
what we again, what we found is that these stages were nonlinear, but there was a process in how an adult child could support their aging parent with type 2 diabetes. It wasn't like, let's go support right now, but there was this process between a parent and their child in terms of support. So that's that's one of our studies that we've done. Um, another study I wanted to share for this with this community that I'm speaking to is um, destigmatizing hepatitis B in the Asian American community and lessons learned learned from the San Francisco Hepatitis B Free Campaign. I want to say that sometimes support in our community is hindered by silences around many illnesses and diseases in our community. Um, and I, I think because there are silences around it, it's sometimes hard to gain support. But I want to talk about this really unique health campaign that occurred uh, here in San Francisco. Um, and um, because it delivered really messages through public service announcements that were educational, entertaining, and culturally sensitive. And they were presented by uh, respected leaders. And there you see on the right of your screen, you see um, some of their um, ads of be a hero, um, save save lives, save lives. And so, you know, get tested, get vaccinated. That's been part of their campaign. It's been going on for about 14 years. But I, what I found as a medical sociologist so amazing about this campaign were the public disclosures by public officials uh, uh, about, you know, having hepatitis B. And um, I wanted to share, uh, by the way, and, and that was sort of my key findings is that, that we can move away from stigma Stigma is, is um, a label or a judgment um, that often occurs sometimes when people sort of disclose that they have a particular health condition. And so I felt this campaign really destigmatized hepatitis B. In one way, they did talk about hepatitis B is that, is that it wasn't about bad people or bad behavior. That was a key finding. And that they were also moving stigma aside by normalizing this discussion of hepatitis B by utilizing public disclosures. Um, and then finally motivating action by emphasizing solutions that we can do something about this. And so again, this campaign has been so unique. I wanted to share a little bit uh, about the campaign. Again, it's, it's over 14 years old, it's still going, um, but I felt uh, this public disclosure by this newscaster, um, Alan Wang was kind of amazing, so I wanted to share this. It's ABC 7 News at 11. And thousands gathered in San Francisco to celebrate Asian heritage and join the fight against an illness that infects one in 10 Asian people. And crowds filled San Francisco's Civic Center Plaza today for the annual Asian Heritage Street Celebration. Admission was free, and so were screenings for hepatitis B. One in 10 Asians is infected with the virus, but the Hep B Free campaign started here in San Francisco has been making huge strides in fighting the epidemic, which can lead to liver cancer. Recently, the Assistant Secretary for the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services announced a nationwide action plan. So he has a plan where he wants to put hepatitis to the forefront, and that's combating hepatitis B and C. So it's a program, again, uh, physician education, community education. And I happen to be that one in 10 of Asian people infected with hepatitis B. I was infected at birth, but since I was screened, I was right. able to do something about it. I take a pill. I went from 13 million copies of the virus attacking my liver to wow. zero. I'm undetectable. Good for you. Yeah. And of course, you're wearing the lapel pin in exactly. honor of uh, everyone wanting to get that screen. Exactly. The hepatitis B free campaign. So again, I, I've appreciated this campaign because of public disclosures like that. And again, breaking silences around hepatitis B. And I think it's this campaign has been incredibly influential, uh, again, because of people's public disclosures. Um, so let me go into my next slide. Um, so when we think about um, social support, health illness and Asian Americans, um, there's need, we need more research, by the way, and we really need more research. We need to study social networks. We need to study subpopulations, and we need to think about various illnesses um, and conditions. And I really do think that we really need to look at the impact of COVID-19 and anti-Asian anti hate in our community how, and, and sort of how support has evolved and support needs. Um, and also um, one area that I haven't fully jumped into, of which I think we need more understanding and research is the need for more understanding around gender and cultural differences and help seeking and social support as it relates to relational concerns of not wanting to burden or worry others. Um, and as 
result, because people keep things to themselves, um, you know, people eventually just keep their problems to themselves and to themselves and maybe not um, receive any social support. And so these are some things I'm really intrigued by, interested in doing some more, and that I feel like we, we need more information on. Um, but I also want to say, you know, during this pandemic um, and this time of anti-Asian hate, this has been an opportunity for creating communities of care. And I want to say, um, you know, during the pandemic, we've seen supportive and caring communities such as Asian American nonprofits, Asian American churches, um, and then nonprofits uh, serving Asian American, the Asian American community throughout the United States. I think this has been a time of that. And I, I have to say that for many Asian Americans, um, you know, um, this has maybe been, you know, a time to remember past one's own past history. You know, in my own family, um, my family experienced utter certainty, panic, and fear during the Korean War. Um, as my dad said, the Korean War brought out the selfish, selfish nature of many people. And it was natural just to focus on your own family and not think about others. Um, but also my family members have also said that in the fleeing uh, during the Korean, Korean War, there were also people that acted unselfishly uh, during this time period. And um, my grandmother, for example, was on her last, the last train out of Pusan in which civilians were fleeing for their lives. Um, and she arrived and was the train was packed beyond measure and she got on a train with my uh, uncle who was a baby at the time. And once she got onto the train, there were hordes of people that were climbing on top of the train and the train and they were trying to push my grand, grandmother off the train. And an older man had witnessed this and he said loudly to the crowd, do not throw this mother and baby off the train. Even though we are fleeing from war, we cannot push a mom and her baby off a train. I will make room for her. And so somehow this old older man exhibited extraordinary courage and empathy and leadership. And so as my grandmother entered her 90s in the throes of her dementia, this is a story she would repeat over and over again, that she needed to go thank this man for saving her life and saving my uncle's life. Um, and, and, and she wanted to personally thank him. So I'd like to think that our own crisis of the pandemic has brought out more compassion and care, even when we have been concerned about our own safety. And I, and again, I wanna recognize all the nonprofits that have been doing this work, delivering meals to Asian el elders. I know there's uh, several organizations in the San Francisco Bay Area that have been delivering meals to elders and really co also concentrating on various Asian American communities. Um, but also, uh, you know, in the literature, there, have been, there has been research on Asian American churches also providing informational emotional and spiritual support during this time period. So I really want to recognize that work of support, the, the work of various nonprofits and churches. But I also want to say that this crisis of the pandemic has also brought out um, care among younger people. And this is API Youth Rising. They're an org organization started by middle school schoolers and their mission is to take small actions to make positive change in our communities. Um, and they were started in March, 2021. Um, and they've risen to about 1,200 young people, and they rally to bring awareness uh, to, uh, about the increasing xenophobia against Asian Americans. And so I just want to share this small clip, um, and then... Um, we are back with our series, Generation Next, and a group of friends who are proving that it is never too early to enact change. NBC News Now anchor Savannah Sellers had the chance to talk with them. Good morning. Good morning. That's so true. Never too early because the girls I'm about to introduce you to are middle schoolers, but they're also activists in the AAPI community, educating other kids and some of us adults along the way. If adults don't do anything, we have to do something. And if we don't do anything now, it's not going to change. For teens Mina Fedor, Ashi Gupta, C. Uri, and Charlie Trenkel, activism was never in their plans. We never really started off like, I'm going to found an organization, we're going to be a group, we're going to get that 501c3. It was more of like a friend thing. These eighth graders are the founders of AAPI Youth Rising, an organization focused on taking small actions to make a big difference. Each of them impacted by the rise in attacks against Asian Americans during the pandemic. And once, uh, I think we were somewhere, and my mom told us not to speak in Mandarin, which was like, I was kind of confused at that time, but then I realized like later why. They said something about me going back to my own country. It hurts a lot because I've been here. 
After speaking out in a virtual school assembly, Mina decided to gather people in real life by organizing a rally with the help of friends last March in Berkeley, California. Is this what it means to be Asian American youth right now? I thought, oh, that would be a great idea just to I don't know, do something fun and, you know, make something and have a positive message for the API community. The rally drew a crowd of 1,200, giving them the confidence to double down on their work. What makes you decide, hey, now this is really an organization? Seeing the impact the rally made, it just really made us realize that we can, like, make a difference. So tell me about the work that you're doing. Uh, one by 180 Pledge. We ask people to support team just one day. On one day of AAPI history out of the 180 instructional days of the school year. These young women crafted the material for that course themselves and they'll be the ones teaching it in their school with other schools following soon. So if we're taught what we're experiencing and what AAPI people have contributed to our community, it would be very important for everyone to know about because then we know that AAPI people actually belong in America and it's not we're not like foreigners or the model minority. They also joined other student-led coalitions in support of AB 101, a bill that would require every public high school student in California to take an ethnic studies course, signed by Governor Gavin Newsom last October. What was it like, I mean, you're all middle schoolers, getting involved in a legislative process. The biggest sort of or most impactful actions you can take are often supporting legislative bills. I had to find out how the um, California legal system works. I had to <laughs> figure all this stuff out. What is it like to fit this into school schedules, after school activities? I mean, I think of it as like a part-time job, even though I never had a job before. <laughs> it's a job they take seriously, just recently helping to bring this mural to life. Honoring AAPI heroes and partnering with American Girl on the 2022 Girl of the Year, the first Chinese American doll to take the honor. Young people showing you don't have to be an adult to make change. What's your hope when other middle schoolers see what you guys are doing? Just like talk to people, get the word out about whatever issue it is that you feel really passionate about fighting for. You don't have to create a club or create an organization, create a group to affect other people. Normalizing this sensitive conversation um, in everyday life is also going to be extremely helpful in creating a change. Now, the AAPI course that this group created is now in full swing. Get this, they're already booked to teach themselves in three states. Whoa, and they're wow. encouraging young students to join in teaching their own classes and at their own schools. It's really cool what they're doing. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed that short clip. I was inspired by this young, this young group of the young, these young, um, this young group, uh, API Youth Rising, and the work they've been doing to create change again during the pandem pandemic and during an the an anti Asian hate. Um, I we are back whoops, with our whoops. series Generation yeah, Next and a group of friends. I want to make mention, um, I've been involved in my own sort of mutual aid during the pandemic. This is myself at Grocery Outlet in, in March 2020 um, when we could not find a mask. Uh, and I didn't know how to sew. Uh, and this was the first mask that I had sewn and I had given it to uh, folks at Grocery Outlet, um, but also um, also joining the anti-sewing squad during the pandemic. In fact, I've been part of the anti-sewing squad. Again, I didn't know how to sew, but I learned to sew. And we've made 350,000 masks. And at the very beginning of this pandemic, we were making masks for Muni, Muni bus drivers. Um, and it's been an amazing process supporting uh, folks and, and, and also teaching some students. I've taught some students how to sew masks uh, and they've uh, learned this new skill. And so it's been an amazing process of mutual aid and amazing process at, at a time of crisis to support others. And again, I wanna say that the pandemic and anti-Asian hate can also be this time to cultivate and create supportive communities. Um, and I'm grateful to be part of the community that had been, I had uh, joined, which was the anti-sewing squad. Anyways, that's the end of my presentation. Great. Thanks so much, Dr. Yu. Fantastic talk. And thank you so much for coming today. Appreciate your talk and uh, appreciate all your collaboration with Stanford Care. And uh, please join us. We actually, our next talk uh, for the audience is actually uh, next week. I think uh, Karina Kim, uh, our program coordinator, put it in the chat. Uh, so st stay tuned for that. Uh, and great thanks to the, the Vincent V.C. Wu Foundation uh, for sponsoring this series. Thank you so much. Have a great week. Great. Thank you.